Good morning. This is the morning meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on April 27th, and we are um, appreciate uh, representatives of the Vermont Housing Conservation Board for coming in and helping us to understand the governor's proposal as it relates to housing um, and the creation of more housing and um, in, without any further ado, let me turn this over to Mr. Selig. I assume you will kick us off, Gus. We, yep. we try to get formal when we um, have guests in here. And so forgive me if I lapse occasionally, but Mr. Selig, thank you. And Ms. Holler, thank you for joining us. Okay, um, Madam Chair, for the record, Gus Seelig, Director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And I think we're here primarily to talk about uh, the governor's proposal uh, to use ARPA funds um, to meet the state's housing needs. And I will get into that in a moment uh, in terms of his $249 million request, which I think also came with a request to loop appropriate at least something over a hundred million dollars in this year's budget and talk about what the other body has done. Um, before I get into that, I guess I just want to first say a thank you to the committee because as you began the session, the governor had recommended a one time of $20 million and you decided to double down on that and increase the funding by to 40 million in one time funding. Um, the appearance of ARPA changes the calculation somewhat. Um, I understand that the other body has actually taken your recommendation and increased it by about another $10 million, but they have not appropriated ARPA funding um, to any significant degree beyond the VHIP program uh, in the budget that they voted out of committee yesterday. Um, let me back into the need issue, and I think, um, Representative Fagan's remarks before you went live just speak to um, the tremendous need. And so although we have moved lots of people out of motels uh, with the work that you, the monies you provided us through CRF last year, um, the problems that the state is seeing in terms of its housing needs um, continue to strain our system dramatically. And while it is certainly better for people to be in motels than it is to be in the woods um, in the midst of a pandemic or doubled and tripled up with, with neighbors, um, it causes its own problems. So there's, as of a couple of weeks ago, my understanding is there were 2,700 Vermonters, about 1,900 families still in the motels. The depth of the problem we're facing, and I think the reason the governor is proposing what I've called a moonshot on housing is that people with Section 8 vouchers are not able to find housing, which speaks to a supply problem all over the state. Um, and I think as we testified at the beginning of the session, there was lots of information, data, anecdotal, and both borne out in the transfer tax revenue of folks from out of state seeing Vermont as a great place, safe place to be and buying properties up. And we have a really hot real estate market today that is driving the cost of housing up. Um, my friends at the Housing Finance Agency report that the average single family home in Vermont last year, new home, newly constructed home was a $450,000 proposition. There was an article in the New Yorker a few weeks ago um, uh, about out of state investment groups, not just in Vermont, but all over the country looking for real estate investments, particularly in mobile home parks. We're seeing that play out with um, the proposed sale of several parks right now. Um, and and there there is reason to think also that out-of-state investors are looking for rental investments as well where they can jack rents up. Um, so those are the, the factors that are driving our problems today. On a personal level, you know, I, I was just thinking about when I got out of college in the mid seventies and I rented an old farmhouse um, in North Callis with a pal of mine for 150 bucks a month. Um, I'm sure that that house, if on the market as a rental today, would be 17 or 1800 a month. And the entry level salaries since that time have not gone up by 10 times when you're leaving college and getting your first job. It just speaks to 
um, a great imbalance between what Vermonters earn and what it costs to rent housing, to buy housing, and what it costs to build housing. Um, and we have seen great increases in construction costs over the last year. Um, some of that is related to the pandemic in terms of supply chain interruptions, um, but the price of plywood apparently went up greatly after the power outages in Texas where lots of plywood is, gets put together. Um, so the problems are getting worse. And I would say that um, what you did last year with CR with your fast track bill signaled to everybody that you were ready and serious to take aim at the housing issue. And that resulted in lots of applications. Similarly with 315 this year, you provided $10 million. We asked for letters of intent to apply for that money to do fast track housing. And within two weeks we had applications or letters of intent to apply that totaled $27.5 million with a variety of different kinds of projects to relieve the pressures on motels and the GA program. So we think that there is more, if we, if we put out a second letter, we're sure that that would double. Um, to talk about what the needs are or what the program would be around increased appropriations, um, the biggest need in the state is rental housing uh, and more multifamily rental housing. Obviously, there is a significant, and that will be part of the solution to the problem of homelessness um, and the problems in the motels. I would say that um, it is important as you consider the governor's recommendation um, that um, what he put together was uh, a proposal for uh, adding shelter capacity fast track housing to relieve homelessness and more integrated housing. And I think the problems Representative Fagan was talking about before you went live speaks to the, that the best practice is absolutely to integrate people into the communities, not to isolate them um, and to create mixed income housing multi with, with a multitude of folks. That's what we did with a housing revenue bond. Um, but obviously homeless relief, anything we can do quickly should be a priority. I've spoken in the past about mobile home parks and that need um, that is being driven in part by out-of-state investments, but I've also talked about the need to invest as uh, in a project like um, Tri Park, and there are many others around the state where the infrastructure is worn out and without any help, um, people are really gonna struggle. The, the two parks on the market right now, if there's no public intervention, the rents would go to $530 a month to rent your lot before you get to your housing costs. Um, we had a report issued about a week ago on the need for farm worker housing that two other two of, two of other committees in the house have taken testimony on. There's a big need there. There is home ownership uh, that really needs to be a part of a, a focus and is part of the governor's proposal. And what I'd say to you is that today, nobody is building in Vermont on any scale, entry level starter housing, unless you're building your own home. Um, nobody's building a 1200 square foot cape or ranch. It's not, it costs too much to build. It's not profitable. And, it, you, and we need some incentives. And this is part of the governor's proposal to do that. The VHIP program has been a great success. Um, there is money that the Senate approved to continue that program through ARPA. Um, we've had discussions uh, with the committee and the other body about um, about innovative ideas like accessory dwelling units. Uh, we did some of that uh, with technical assistance with the revenue bond. That's something that could be done across the state. And then finally, I just don't want to forget it. There's a need for recovery residences across the state to deal with the opioid problem. Um, since it became clear that you were providing more resources and since President Biden announced his jobs and infrastructure package, um, we are getting um, lots and lots of requests for what we for our feasibility grant program. This is a small grants that help developers explore can a project really take place. So we usually spend um, $150,000 a year at max on a program like that. In the last two and a half months, we've had 10 requests that would exhaust that fund. Um, so people 
once you signal that there's an opportunity, people are going to develop it. Um, I know that I'm, I, I don't think I'll be repeat myself, but in terms of the opportunities, um, what we wanna do is not just look at the issue of shovel readiness, but shovel worthiness. Um, in your, in 315, I think it was, you asked for a working group, that working group that, that would include, that would be led by DCF and um, the Department of Housing and include us and VHFA. That group's been meeting about weekly um, to talk about how to integrate capital dollars with service dollars with rental assistance and is beginning to form the outlines of a plan to help do that. Um, we don't have all the answers yet, but it, I think it speaks to what the governor's goals are uh, with his proposal. To give you a few examples around the state, uh, this was not in my consciousness when I uh, talked to you um, early in the session, um, but uh, Chair Stevens let me know that Stanley Hall and the, on the Waterbury campus has been taken down. And he, he says Waterbury thinks that would be a great place for housing. Uh, two weeks ago, the director of Washington County Mental Health called me about a building she owns, her organization owns in Montpelier that could be converted to housing. Um, the folks at Christ Church in Montpelier uh, with the failure of the garage project are ready to use their land and, and in addition to their to the church to provide 25 units of housing. Um, there are four or five projects in, in the Brattleboro, Wyndham County area that have been in some stage of discussion to take place over five years that would provide close to 100 units of housing that could be done much more rapidly. Um, I saw in the newspapers, and I don't speak with any knowledge about availability, that uh, the city of Rutland made a deal to buy a facility for recreation on the St. Joseph's campus. I don't know if there are other buildings on that campus that could be converted to housing, but we would wanna look at that. We looked at a building uh, up the road a few years ago across from the Marble Museum that I think is still vacant. And I think there are gonna be opportunities across the state to convert what had been used as office space into other sorts of facilities. One of the fast track projects we got was a project like that in St. Johnsbury that can provide 10 units of housing that had been more of an office location before. So um, across the state, I think there are opportunities. We did, after meeting with the committee, um, talk with the chancellor and her CFO. They asked us not to visit the state colleges until the students left for COVID reasons. So shortly after May 17th, we are gonna look at uh, buildings at Johnson and Linden and, uh, and at VTC, as you had suggested. We know that there's a big hole on the ground in Newport. We know that there's a neighborhood in Windsor called Jarvis Street that meet, that the community very much wants to revitalize. Uh, there's an, also an opportunity, I think, in downtown Windsor. So what I would say to you about the governor's proposal is if you move it forward, um, it will signal to the development community that the state is serious and gonna go on a multi-year effort to create, to, to fix the imbalance that we've all had in the housing market. Um, and again, as I said earlier, um, I'm sure that if we send out a second uh, request for letters of interest, as we did about the rapid, the $10 million you made available in 315, that the need uh, would more than double, uh, the, or the requests for those funding, that funding would more than double. Um, so I, I think with that, um, I'd be, the, the governor's proposal is in five different buckets. The, I think it's imaginative, creative, it's powerful. Um, obviously it's sort of the sort of moment for somebody like me has been waiting my entire career for this kind of an opportunity. Um, to really do more than the, make incremental progress on this issue, to really change the balance and have a more, much more balanced and equitable housing market and be able to meet more people's needs. Um, the one thing that I would just say as you consider that is that it would be good, again, to create the best practice is to create housing for a range of people and not to isolate people who have had great financial and other difficulties in their lives all into one, 
lo single locations. Um, and we've done that successfully. Usually there's an executive order that requires that 15% of the publicly funded housing in the state uh, be provided to Vermonters who've experienced homelessness. Most of the providers we work with uh, have provided more than 20% of their housing to families that experience homelessness, but it is in a mixed income setting. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer questions rather than to, um, to go on at length, uh, but I do wanna just convey my enthusiasm and support for what the governor's put forward. Um, we had a, a, um, a feedback session with a number of stakeholders yesterday. I think there were more than 70 people on the call. There is great interest and great enthusiasm. This was done by the working group. Um, and, um, and people would like to know just how to get started. There were a lot of questions like, how are you gonna really do this? How are you gonna pull it off? And I guess I would just, going back to the notion of a moonshot, there's enough people on this call that are near my age that you know, when Jack Kennedy said, we're gonna to go to the moon, he didn't know how we were gonna get there. I can't give you all the details. I can't promise you that we'll get exactly to 5,000 units today, but I think that that the times call for and COVID has shown the need for a dramatic uh, response to the state's housing needs. And you can look at that from the perspective of the problems that you were talking about in the Rutland motels, or you can look at it from the perspective of employers who are looking for more opportunities for their workforce given where our, our wages are to be able to afford quality housing in the state uh, or as part of the state's meeting the state's demographic challenges. So I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Selig, for laying it out so eloquently for us to understand what's being proposed. We have a couple of questions. Representative Helm? Bob? Oh, he's looks like he's still having Bob. Yeah, I thought my telephone company was making headway. They spent all day Friday and it's as bad now as it was when I started. I'm gonna just unplug here. <laughs> One, it's awful. I but Bob, anyway. I, Bob, I feel for you. I'm actually at a neighbor's house because Consolidated is not delivering internet to my house and hasn't uh, it's been, they promised to call back in 24 hours and it's been two days. I have no idea when they'll, they're even planning to show up. Yeah, that's the same company I'm working with, right? <laughs> what? Anyways, so I just wanted to say you were giving a list of possible purchases or, or development projects that you might look into in the future. I just came from a meeting where there was a group that thought you ought to look at buying the quality in in Rutland. <laughs> but I won't go any further than that. That's it, man. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Representative Iacovoni. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Selig. Always good to see you. Um, uh, I'm trying to, what's behind my questioning is total capacity needed and total resources necessary to meet that capacity. You used the number a little while ago, 5,000. I didn't know if that was for illustrative purposes or if that's the assessment on the uh, amount, uh, the number of affordable housing units that are needed. Um, that's the number the governor used in his proposal for 200. $49 million. And I don't know that we can achieve that goal, but that's the goal that he's set forth. And I think it's a mix of both um, market rate and affordable units, as I understand the proposal. What's What capacity do you have? What's the total amount of money you could process annually? Is there a limit on that where you just, your systems couldn't do any more than a certain amount? I'm trying to find out how many years it might take? Um, well, I think the, the question of capacity, again, th these are the kinds of questions people were asking on our call yesterday. But the first thing that I would do, quite frankly, is to make some investments in the capacity of our community providers, because most of them, with a few exceptions of the larger organizations, are used to doing 
one project a year. Um, and so we want to strengthen that capacity. We do have a statewide group called uh, Housing Vermont. They actually have a new name, Evernorth, and they work all over the state and they can strengthen uh, the local capacity um, greatly. So, you know, one of the proposals we just got in with the $10 million would give us um, nine units in Stowe and two in Morrisville um, with the capacity to add on the, on the Stowe site in the future. And that is partly because the Memorial Housing Partnership has a, has a uh, relationship with them. So we will definitely invest in, we, did, we will invest in capacity, we'll invest more in our feasibility program so that uh, people have the dollars to do the investigation of is a project feasible or not. Um, what I can tell you is that during the housing revenue bond, we moved up to the place where we were doing $20 million of investment per year. Then last year you said to us, can you move $33 million in nine months? And we did that. Um, and I don't know today where the limit of our capacity is. One of the things that will have to happen necessarily is that we will get less leverage uh, depending on when president, when or if President Biden passes the infrastructure and jobs package. And that means we're gonna have to put more dollars per unit into every unit we develop. Uh, there's a limit on something called the low income housing tax credits, 9% tax credit program, which is what we usually work with. So once we've maxed that out, we have to provide more funding for every unit we do. So I, I, can't, I don't have a precise answer today other than we'll invest in the capacity to speed things up. I, I feel like I need to go find a book about how FDR and Harold Dickey's scaled up the New Deal as quickly as they did. Um, I think it's that sort of a challenge that's in front of us and that's what we intend to do. Um, so, but I'm also very mindful and I've heard Secretary Budovich use this phrase and so now I'm using it, that there's a big difference between shovel ready and shovel worthy. And we wanna make sure, I think the reason the program has been successful is that projects, if I'm thinking about your district like Arthur's have enhanced the community. Um, and if you look back to housing from many years ago, it was poorly constructed and poorly located and it, and it isolated low income Vermonters or low income people, not just in Vermont, but around the country and was not well received. So we wanna hit that balance as well. So there's, there's quality and quantity. Um, so there's, I know there's many variables involved. One is, uh, and averages are misleading, but there's the cost per unit. And then there's the dollars you can leverage um, from various sources to bring the cost per unit to some type of affordability. And it sounds like both of those variables are in play um, given factors beyond our control. Absolutely. Um, the price of materials has gone up since the pandemic began. Um, you know, we did a project in Representative Fagan's district with a great contractor um, and huge cooperation from Act 250 who moved it way faster than they usually do. But the reason it got done at a high cost is that the contractor, Naylor and Green, had their employees work 10 days, 10 hour days and Saturdays. And we would not have met the CRF deadline without that. So the cost went up because we were paying overtime. Um, and, you know, I, I can guarantee you, I, I wish this were not the case, um, but there will be sellers who see that there's a huge amount of public money and the price is going to go up. You know, so how we proceed around that is going to be a challenge for us. There, uh, but but that's that's just a fact of life in the real estate market. If there's a lot of a lot of public money available, we we'll, we will see prices rise in terms of what people's expectations are. I hope that because the commercial real estate market is likely to change as people need less office space, that there'll be some offsetting pressures that will will temper that. But we will definitely see prices go up. Thank you. Uh, one last thought on the price issue, which is I, I've been doing this for a long time, as you know, some people would say too long. 
but it, everything we did 10 and 15 years ago that we thought, oh my God, this is so expensive, today looks like a bargain. I don't have any reason to believe if we waited five years that prices will go down. Thank you. It, um, what you, you've evoked um, some of our history, some of our positive history in terms of, you know, getting to the moon or the new deal. I'm, I'm also thinking of one of our um, not so great history points where we did urban renewal and, you know, knock down neighborhoods to put highways through them in the name of, you know, some good. You, you when, when you look at projects, you have criteria that you follow that, that looks at mixed income and how it contributes to the community. Can you just talk a little bit about how you do that to assure that the, um, the developments are integrated into the community rather than isolated? Um, it, it, we, we have an example here of an old project, a, a, a way old project that's, that's down a a, a road and kind of isolated and gets a few more police cars than other people, other places do, um, just because we've packed a handful of people into kind of dense area, a isolated area. Um, well, I, what I would say is that when you look at the, the enabling statute for the Housing and Conservation Board, um, historic preservation is part of our mission. Um, and so that has always made um, the renewal of the state's historic fabric um, really important and why a project like the French block in Montpelier, the Tuttle block in Rutland, uh, the project uh, the new now called the New Avenue Hotel in St. Johnsbury have always been priorities for us to invest. And that means putting developments in places that are gonna be in to some degree convenient to services whether those services are a grocery store, medical services, um, all the, you know, a public library and so on and so forth. And um, so that's a part of our, our, our mission. Um, and the historic, when you look at our mission, it, it is also about preserving the countryside. So we don't want to um, put, develop sprawl projects where people will be isolated. Um, so those are, those are, and over the years, our board has developed a series of policies that speak to that. Um, the governor, when he proposed the housing revenue bond was very strong on, you do a great job on serving people up to 60% of median. I'd really like to see us, which is a limit that the tax credit program uses, but I'd like it to see you guys invest a little more and go beyond those Vermonters who are below 60% of median and be able to serve somebody who's at 80% of median, which for most of the state for a family of three or four might be 40, $45,000 a year. Um, and we made that part of the program and we certainly would within uh, the context of the work that, that we need to do going forward. So I, I, those are some of the things that we do to try to ensure that projects are not isolated locationally. Um, we have done, I have to say, several smaller projects, you know, 20 units and below that are sometimes single purpose housing. Um, we try to make sure that services are there. Uh, you know, we help uh, Orange County Mental Health buy a four unit building for its clients that's right in downtown Randolph. Again, convenient to services. Not everything can be in a downtown or a neighborhood adjacent to a downtown. So then we look to, is there good bus service or is there not? Or is the community willing to extend bus service? So those are all the things that go into how we uh, think about and plan for projects is, is what's the location? What's the service mix? Can you walk anywhere to services? Is there any public transit? Can there be more public transit? Um, and and the, the program mix, uh, calls for different levels of affordability within a, within a project. It doesn't call for just, with, with a few exceptions, just having folks 
who all have great difficulty in one location. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Representative Fagan. Thank you. And Gus, thank you for coming in. I really do appreciate it. I always enjoy talking to you. So the governor's got, there's a lot of proposals out there and it's not just the governor's, it's, it's some are ours and some are everyone's. And for example, I'll just use an example. And, and what I'm asking is, is cross coordination between all of those projects such that there may be some things that are that are being worked on like Brownsfields uh, projects that might actually, um, um, if located in the correct place, I'm thinking the old Rutland dress factory, um, that uh, that's been sitting vacant for 100 years. I don't know. That's a long time. Um, that uh, that w might be really good place for, for yours. So what I'm not asking about my specific, like the Rutland Dress Factory. I'm asking cross coordination between programs. Are you starting to, um, you know, is there is there starting to be a work group put together somewhere that can talk about, hey, we've got something that, that I think you can be a part of, that type thing? Yes. That The short answer is yes and yes. Um, okay. So um, we are talking regularly with Commissioner Hanford. Uh, we are, ANR is actually represented on my board. Um, you know, so to the extent that there are cleanup funds in either of those agencies, we're talking about how can we put them together? Should there be money for infrastructure that ANR is administering? We want that as part of our thinking as we work with the residents of a mobile home park who want to buy their park because most of their water and sewer systems are ancient and some of them are not public systems, they're on-site systems. Um, and so whether it's this dress factory, which I'm not particularly aware of, or the Jarvis Street neighborhood in Windsor or any number of locations around the state, we are looking at how do we put the different resources together. And I think a chief value of the work that we've always tried to do is to get multiple benefits for a community. Um, one of the hardest things to do is to combine um, housing and retail, but we've done that on a number of occasions with downtown buildings uh, where that becomes part of the program. Thank so you. we're looking for multiple goods is the short answer. Thank you, good. Representative Iacoboni. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I don't expect you to present the administration's proposal but you may be able to comment on this. If I take 249 million and divide it by 5,000, that's like 50,000 a unit. I must be missing something because how do you, how do you uh, address the problem at 50,000 a unit? Uh, Unless the leveraging is just incredible. Um, well, I don't think you, you do need more money. You do need to leverage more money. And I, that's why I, we did not uh, go over the numbers carefully with them um, before they announced their plan. Um, so that that number may be optimistic without significant leveraging. Uh, it has to be optimistic without significant leveraging. Um, but we can attack the problem significantly with two hundred forty nine million dollars. And we can leverage some dollars. We just will not leverage as much because there's a limit to the 9% low income housing tax credit that the state is allocated. Yeah. There, is a, there is a proposal in Congress to increase that program by 25%, uh, so that will help, but we will need more leverage and you're absolutely right and um, uh, about that. Well, um, and what I'm, I'm trying to send the message also to our, uh, this committee's conferees that uh, there's so many different needs. And frankly, I don't have my ARPA spreadsheet now to know if there's anything left over being held for the future, but um, housing may be another one where it's even more might be needed. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, I, I, I think this, you, you raise an interesting point I, in Gus's talked about this as a moonshot. And I think the governor's numbers are aspirational. I, I, I'm not sure any of us know what the right number is. And in five years, I hope we're not critical of each other because we didn't hit a target. Um, I think what we're hearing is we have a, a, a 
an extraordinary opportunity to actually make a difference in the fabric of our communities and in the lives of, of Vermonters. And so how can we best take advantage of it? Um, the moonshot makes us look out. I'm concerned about what the next year looks like. Um, and this is not the HCB's problem, but one of the other issues that we have is the, and you opened with this, Gus, what you said, 2,700 folks um, living in um, housing that we've provided that we're going to lose. And we will not have an ability to replace that lost housing um, in the time frame that we're looking at. So committee, I think we have to put our arms around what that means. Um, we're this afternoon are going to hear from DCF on their um, housing proposal, but we need to be conscious, conscious of what the challenge is there. And I think to the meeting that Reps Fagan, Helm, and Harrison were in this morning. We need to also talk about the services that are necessary to avoid the problems that are created by folks living on top of each other in very difficult circumstances and, and not even mentioning the difficult circumstances that folks bring in with when they're in these sort of situations. So we don't have a solution for that problem. I wonder, Gus, to bring this back to you all. I mean, one of the concerns over the years has been the state's ability to provide ongoing services within some of the housing that you help facilitate the development of, be it vouchers, which, is less of a concern right now, but, but also the mental health, health care, um, substance use, et cetera, services. Do, not your problem, but would you care to comment on what we ought to be thinking about in order to make, because these places are not going to be successful unless we also put that ongoing support in some of the places that we're talking about. Um, so let me um, differ with you a little bit um, to this degree, which is it is our problem because when projects are not successful, mm -hmm. when there is dysfunction uh, from a single tenant, it affects a whole building um, because it, it can affect the neighborhood. And so, um, you know, uh, when Representative Iacovoni had our section of the budget, we would have an annual discussion about the need for services and housing to be integrated. There's an excellent program that many of you are aware of called SASH, and it is a population-based program centered in housing. And it brings together all the folks who work with elderly people, um, whether it's from a AAA, a mental health agency, um, a home health agency in a, in a team approach to help make sure that when somebody's having a problem, they figure it out and address it. Um, there is a proposal to do that and we, we help to fund it um, at a family level. I know that the Agency of Human Services through the group work we've been doing with them uh, is gonna propose some changes in their Medicaid waiver to do some work. There's a demonstration program right now at two housing locations in the state where a clinical social worker is embedded into the nature of the housing. The Champlain Housing Trust would tell you with one of the motel projects we did with them, because they were able to buy it without debt with the CRF funding, that's allowing them to use the rents they're collecting to have social services on site. So this is absolutely a critical issue. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we'll serve, solve it in perpetuity. There is an allowance for some of the rental assistance money to be used for services. That's short term, not long term. Um, but it really gets to the issue of, of, you know, how do we make sure that 
uh, Vermonters can be as successful as possible. There's a model that we have worked with, and this is the model that's going to go into the um, former ICM school in Rutland called permanent supportive housing. It's one that we used at Great River Terrace, uh, which is a similar community that opened a couple of years ago in Brattleboro. But the mental health agency is going to be providing an on-site person there for a number of hours a week as that property is repurposed as housing for people who've experienced homelessness. So this is abs this cross-agency collaboration is absolutely essential to, to ultimately a successful outcome, particularly for those Vermonters who've struggled the most. Now there's a whole other range of Vermonters who may just be struggling with the dislocation from the pandemic, having lost a job. They may need some temporary help yeah. rather than ongoing help. Um, but people go through cycles in their life where sometimes you need some help and some and many, you may go years where everything's just fine. Um, and we, but we absolutely need to be able, as we do our work and we do our planning and we do our project development to integrate that kind of thinking into the design of the housing we build. Thank you. And um, to my knowledge, there are not dollars from in the governor's proposal that are explicitly tied into the support services, et cetera, um, around housing. I mean, we've added some money and we've talked about what the challenges are with the uh, DCF population, but I, I don't recall there being a, po a pot of money. Am I remembering um, wrong? Um, there is not in the capital proposal that he made. Jen, do you, I believe that there's a plan, but correct me if I'm wrong, for some of the rental assistance funding to be used for services. Actually, I, I do know. I believe that there is uh, some funds, but they they have to do with the requirements around the federal requirements around use of that emergency rental. For example, you have to guide people through attestations. You have to, um, on ESSER 2, there's uh, more requirements about income. So you have to get the tax document. You have to get all, all of the income verification through. And that's a lot of what I understand. And we can confirm this later this afternoon with DCF is what those 17 temporary serve or limited service positions are but i don't i don't know that um beyond that it's getting at some of the factors that we're hearing this morning about what makes something successful in the long term and i think that's vital as everyone has already noted okay jen did you want miss holler did you want to add anything to that so my understanding tracks representative Fessups, of course, um, and I think what we're understanding is that the governor's proposal for the um, you know one billion dollars is really around capital investments, and they um, that proposal assumes that some of the other categorical grant programs that are included in the American Rescue Plan Act, such as the emergency rental assistance and others would provide some of those services supports. Um, but as Representative Jessup has said, there are a good number of strings that come with each of those. Um, so maybe this is a, a, a time for me to be able to say that um, um, the Senate budget as it's coming out of the Appropriations Committee strikes the Housing Recovery Working Group. Um, but regardless of where that lands or not, the funders ha um, have been meeting historically, but when you pass um, that charge in your version of the budget, we formalized that group and focused specifically on how to use the ARPA resources. Um, and, um, I've been developing a number of strategies and planning tools around that, and we'll continue to do that regardless of whether there's a specific direction to us to do that or not. Um, and because the ARPA funds aren't here yet, and there's no guidance on the one billion, or um, nor is there for many of the other programs that are included in that act, um, we are, you know, focused on kind of strategies and tools for being able to bring services, capital, and rental assistance in a way that's going to be able to absorb whatever resources come our way, which are going to be determined by what you and the Senate decide that you want to make in terms of appropriations, what ultimately the rules for all those programs are, and then 
whatever additional federal resources may come, whether it's in the form of additional federal low-income housing tax credits or something in the infrastructure bill. Although I will say that at the listening session Gus described yesterday of the working group, we heard clearly from the congressional delegation staff that we're best focused on the resources that we have because they don't have clarity at all on what might be coming in the infrastructure bill. And in fact, the Republican counter proposal in the Senate um, is, is based on the premise that housing is not infrastructure and wouldn't be included. And that's all to be negotiated, but I don't think we can count on that coming. <laughs> Hopefully it will. Thank you. Um, committee, other questions or thoughts? Uh, this is likely our last chance to have a conversation with the folks from VHCB. We don't know what the, you, you know, we follow what the Senate does. We kind of have a general understanding, but in the next couple of weeks, we're going to make a decision and set ourselves on a path. So can, one last call for questions. Uh, Representative Iacoboni. I apologize. Um, uh, like our friends in Rutland this morning in Lamoille, we had our housing meeting yesterday. So this is uh, fresh on my mind. Um, there's no uh, numbers, but we heard a lot of testimony that much of our long-term rental housing is being converted to short-term rental housing through Airbnbs and such. Um, again, I don't know how much that means, but it. But I've also heard uh, um, unsolicited from constituents uh, helping me, asking me to help address this issue. So I do think it's real. Uh, what's behind this thought is that our net gain will be reduced for uh, mm -hmm. rental housing opportunities because of the conversion of long-term rental housing uh, into short-term, which is driven by several factors. One, you can get more money and that drives the, uh, the market. Two, there's different kinds of landlord eviction obligations and management of tenants that our current laws don't allow us. Having said all that, are, are, should I be concerned that whatever we're putting into this won't be enough because of the conversion of long-term rental property? And is that yet another pressure that we should be increasing the number of resources on this issue? Um, I think you should absolutely be concerned. Um, you know, short-term rentals are a two-way street. So, you know, if you have an elderly retired person with a big old house, um, and it's in pretty good shape and she supplements her income by renting out a room as on Airbnb. For her, that's a really good thing to the extent that it makes housing less available to the general public, to other constituents of yours who need rental housing because people can make more money this way and it decreases the supply of affordable housing that has an impact as well. So it's a when you get when you get into the issue, it's a two-edged sword, and it's good for some people, and not as good for others, and good for in some communities, and not in not as good in other places. And so I think it's an issue to pay attention to. I think it's something that the legislature is going to have to deal with as a policy and regulatory matter. And I don't think it's a simple like most issues. It's not there isn't one simple fix to it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jen, uh, Ms. Holler. Wonder if I might add that um, your House General Housing and Military Affairs Committee is um, looking at S79, um, which includes a rental housing registry, and that would incorporate short term rentals. So you will have some additional um, information there. And unfortunately, Representative Yakovoni, the um, um, the impact of short-term rentals is much greater in resort communities. So I can, it's, it's, it's consistent with what we see in terms of statewide data that you're hearing about that issue, particularly in your area. Thank you. Um, 
So uh, Mr. Selig and Ms. Holler, thank you very much for joining us here today. And but more importantly, being willing to be the kind of one of the central partners in um, accomplishing what could be an extraordinary thing for the state. Um, it's an exciting moment. It is, and and I, again, I understand the you know the some people may want to hang back a bit, but I would just finish up today with you to say that if you, as with the CRF, if you put when you and your colleagues in the other body get to negotiating, if you put dollars into the budget from ARPA, it's going to send a signal. I can't tell you we're going to get it all out the door this year. I wouldn't try to say that, but it's going to send a really important signal. So. I hope you'll take the governor's proposal and um, and that it'll end up in your budget when you get done negotiating with them. So thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. So committee, we are almost at 10. And um, so floor at 10 back here at one for S102 and then at 2.30, um, we have folks from DCF in for um, to talk about their uh, proposal around emergency housing. Um, we may, I surely hope that we're not going to spend an hour and a half on 102. So maybe we can slot something else in, in there. Um, so see you guys in the afternoon.